you're watching the NWR Virtual Health Conference, May 2020. On the line, we have Dr. Chris Hart from Aventus Medical. Aventus is a Brisbane-based medical device company that is commercializing a unique treatment platform for sleep apnea and snoring. The company has a collaborative sleep physician dental strategy that streamlines patients' access to treatment. Chris is the founder of Aventus Medical and the inventor of O2 Vent design concept. He has overseen the launch of the O2 Vent to patients and clinicians and heads the management team as the company rolls out the Aventus sleep treatment platform with a focus on North America first. Chris is also heavily involved with training and presenting to the dental and sleep. Thanks so much for joining us today, Chris. Over to you with the presentation. Great. Thanks for having me and thanks to everyone for dialing in. Um, as uh, um, was described, we're a sleep apnea um, device company. Um, we're launching in North America. It's a massive market opportunity. I'm going to assume some existing knowledge of the sleep apnea segment and the market as we are, have got limited time um, and focus more on our path to market, our lab and lab business model and um, what we're doing in terms of our response to uh, COVID-19 um, and how that actually in the long term and even the medium term will uh, see us benefit. So we structured sleep apnea, multi-billion dollar issue, fast growing, um, been growing at uh, 15 to 20% CAGR for many years. Uh, only one in five people are diagnosed at the moment and the health economic cost is billions of dollars as well, um, affecting people's health, their productivity, um, increased workplace accidents uh, and long-term issues as well. Um, the standard of care is CPAP, which is the reverse phase vacuum cleaner and the fighter pilot mask. We know that it works, um, but unfortunately not many people are able to tolerate it in the long term. So out of 100 patients that are diagnosed with sleep apnea, 35 will refuse CPAP outright. And out of the 65 that trial CPAP, around 50 of them will take the CPAP home. But within one year, half of them will abandon use of the CPAP. So we have at the moment um, <clears throat> in the US uh, millions of people that have been diagnosed. So there's around about 20 million people in the diagnosed with sleep apnea. Um, only one in five of them have been diagnosed and half of them are outside of care at the moment. So there's around about um, you know, 3 million people there at the moment that are desperate for treatment. One of the main reasons that CPAP um, patients can't adhere to and also the main reason that normal mouth guards that bring the jaw forward don't work uh, is nasal obstruction. I was one of those patients and what happens is that the nose congests during the night uh, when you go from seated to supine or laying down and, as the body shifts and the fluid shifts through the body at night, your nose tends to congest. And when that happens, a patient switch to mouth breathing. And when the switch to mouth breathing occurs, that's when treatment fails. So the CPAP, the pressure runs out. They end up on a full face mask, which requires more pressure and tightening, which causes more, more apnea, which requires more pressure to the point where they'll just throw the mask off. And for a mouth guard, as we open the mouth, the jaw falls back and the tongue obstructs again. So for myself, I developed a mouth guard with an airway in it out of sheer desperation. And as you can see here, the O2 vent has a three-dimensional airway, but allows the air to pass below the nose and soft palate around the tongue, straight into the back of the throat. So this is the only technology that manages the entire upper airway. Um, even CPAP will make nasal obstruction worse. Um, we see uh, efficacy and effectiveness increase as the, we shift to device breathing in this technology as opposed to treatment failing. So the treatment problem um, has actually become the solution. And you can see here uh, that duck bill that allows the air, as we call it, allows the air to flow in between the lips with the mouth closed and the jaw in position straight into the back of the throat. Additionally, we've developed a PEEP or a positive end expiratory pressure valve. And that little flapper valve that goes in the duck bill increases efficacy of further 20%. So compared to a standard mouth guard, we've increased success rates from 56% up to 80%. So very much CPAP-like levels for the vast majority of patients. It's basically a CPAP in your pocket. Um, if we treated the patients that are outside of care at the moment in the US that have been diagnosed, that would be a $2 billion opportunity. Um, and that's growing uh, very quickly as obesity and ageing population increases. So um, we know that people don't use CPAP uh, routinely, but why wouldn't, why wouldn't sleep physicians recommend an oral appliance? Well, oral appliances are only 10% of the therapeutic market. Uh, one of the main reasons is very low efficacy. So you'll say to a sleep doc, why don't you do oral appliance therapy more often? And they'll say, look, it doesn't always work. Once we show them our technology and that goes through the data, the first thing they say is, well, why don't we start with this and use CPAP later? How do I get my patient into care? Historically, patients have bounced around between the sleep position, their primary care position or GP, and also the dentist, and most of them get lost to follow up. So it's a very complex patient journey. Um, the other thing is the sleep doctor said, well, the minute I prescribe an oral appliance, the patient will walk out the door, I'll never see them again, and the dentist will charge them a few thousand dollars for treatment. 
So we have this variable efficacy, which we've dealt with with the technology, the AOI and the peak valve, and then the complex patient journey and the competing economic imperatives we've dealt with by introducing the lab in lab program through North America. And in this program, instead of the patient going from the PCP to the sleep position, to the sleep lab, back to the sleep position, to the DME distributor trial, the CPAP, back to the sleep position, off to the dentist, maybe in the sleep physician's rooms or in the sleep lab or even a durable medical equipment distributor that normally sells CPAP, uh, we can place a scanner in there. Because we're a digital workflow company, uh, we don't require a full dental service or a full dental facility. We just require that a one scanner. So if you look at the middle photo there down the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a little one sitting on the desk, and that's what we've used instead of a dental practice. So we just put a scanner into a sleep facility, the sleep doctor, and now say, hey, um, you could have this instead of a CPAP. If they say that would be great, at that point they can go next door and get scanned. The device gets shipped to the sleep facility and the patient gets treated at the point of care. As well as shared care, um, the contribution that the sleep facility makes to that care can be um, rewarded as well financially. So we have the ability now to treat the patient on the site, deal with the patient, complex patient journey, and also um, through true collaboration and shared care, sharing also the revenue, some of the revenue streams that come with that treatment. So what's driving it? Well, they love the technology, definitely. Um, we're increasing revenue and profit, and the patients love it because they can be treated at the point of care. So it's a true win-win-win. We first launched the program before Optimum was even FDA clear. At that stage, we had two groups contractors. Um, since then, we now have 13 groups contracted. We have 115 groups in discussions. If we look at that deal funnel and we look at, you know, we have these minimum quotas within the agreements where they need to do 20, pay, 20 devices per site per month. Um, Based on that revenue at minimum quotas, this deal funnel at the moment is valued at over $60 million and it's growing very quickly. It's doubling about um, probably every two to three months. Um, the other thing we've done uh, in, in response to COVID-19 is we've, we've reduced costs significantly. So we reduced our fixed costs by over a third um, and we are also um, moving to virtual telehealth um, as well as the lab and lab program. Um, the demand for the lab and lab program has actually accelerated on the back of COVID-19. The reason being is that there's a revenue gap for the sleep labs and the DME now, the DME distributors of CPAP and the sleep physicians. Uh, as well as that, um, you know, they see this as another treatment alternative for their patients. So they're looking uh, to keep their patients in care. To assist with that, we set up our telehealth um, program. And we set that up within about a week or two of COVID-19 breaking in the US. Um, and what we're doing there is all of the sleep docs very quickly switch to telehealth consultations. So we run alongside them and instead of scheduling a, a consultation with a dentist in the facility, they schedule a telehealth consultation with one of our clinical educators and we're then take, making the, uh, the patient intake virtual. So we're bringing them into care, um, pre-authorising their insurance and then booking them for a scan. And what we've seen since we did that is our conversion rates to treatment have increased significantly. So that's become a permanent workflow. We have some sites still scanning um, through COVID-19. Uh, we have a program mapped out to open up again as states come back online. And we're working with one of our partners, Aeroflow, and we've mapped that out through the end of the year. We have seen a 30 to 60 day shift in booked revenue. Um, although we did get a 50%, I think a 55% increase in booked revenue in March. Um, as we start to scan again, I think they, um, the revenues will build up again quite quickly uh, as we're pre-booking patients uh, into um, May and June at the moment. Uh, so this is our, um, our contracted sites. So the, the sites we have contracted are worth over $10 million a year on minimum quotas, and the sites we've launched over $4 million a year. So, um, and those, um, you know, our break-even point is covered now by the sites we have contracted, and that's not to say we don't have a number of large groups in the funnel uh, continuing to negotiate and sign contracts. Uh, that's ongoing, and as I said, the demand has increased significantly. Um, we have shifted to online uh, launches as well. So we're, we're bringing sites online by, um, by online training of the sites and then the telehealth uh, program uh, gets injected into those sites as well. So it's actually become a very efficient, very cost effective um, business with, with higher conversion rates than what we had before, um, albeit we're having to schedule a scan in the future. Um, but in the instance where um, we can't get a patient into the lab, we've also launched a home care program, which is pretty exciting as well. Um, so all the planning is still underway. We're still scheduling patients. You can see now, um, and I'll show you on the next slide, uh, this is where we were um, with these patients building through to February. Uh, and there's the $4 million of sites launched in annualised revenue, 10 million contracted or nearly 11 million. Uh, but what we've done since then, although it's slowed down, we have our exceeded patient bookings since February. 
um, and we are booking scans into the future. Um, so many sites are, are planning to come back online. We're front loading new launches with patients so that when we come online, uh, we should be in revenue very quickly. So we're reducing the lead time to revenue as well. Um, the telehealth and the home care program has been incredibly well received uh, by sleep facilities uh, and that is actually now their preferred method of uh, interacting with us as well. And we're happy to do that because it's very cost effective, very high conversion rates and we get, to, we get closer to the patient and are able to more closely manage that patient journey. Uh, so this is the, the split up I guess that you know roughly a quarter of the patients are telehealth or home care now. Uh, lab and lab we're still booking patients and these are the states we're operating in at the moment. Um, that telehealth is becoming more important as we start to open up. And as we as states open up, we're working with our current the contracted partners as to where we're going to go next. And we've mapped out launches. Uh, we've been launching at the rate of one a week. We've been able to maintain that via telehealth and remote training through COVID-19 um, with forward bookings into May and June for scans. Uh, and now we're, we're mapping out where we're going to go uh, for the rest of this calendar year. So we have a very good program underway. We've got great partners, great contracts, a great model and a great product. Um, we're really excited with the opportunity that has um, opened up for us uh, within or as a result of in some part of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, so, you know, the thing about dentistry is um, if we're just doing uh, fillings, it may not be essential, but if we're managing an airway, it can be deemed essential. And so we get a letter of medical necessity from the sleep physicians and that enables us to continue to scan these patients in certain areas. Um, and you remember that um, we use standard precautions to protect against all pathogens and COVID-19 is just another pathogen. Um, having said that, you know, patients are preferring to stay at home and do telehealth and home care as well um, during the pandemic. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, Medicare and Medicaid um, have expanded telemedicine coverage. There's now been laws passed that insurers need to pay for a telemedicine consult the same as a face-to-face, provided the standard of care is maintained. And so we've set up systems and protocols now to ensure that we can maintain the standard of care remotely and via telehealth. Uh, so again, it's a pretty exciting time. These are just some excerpts from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine indicating that um, CPAP uh, should not be used for patients who are at risk or have COVID-19 if they're in a multi-person dwelling for fear of spread of aerosols through the CPAP. Um, and this is just the um, American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine saying that, um, you know, it could be deemed essential treatment. So those two things in combination um, have led to a situation where first responders, starting in Ontario actually, is now spreading across Canada and starting in the US as well, um, have been told not to use their CPAP. Um, while, uh, while, while they're working or while they're in the uh, fire station overnight. So we teamed up um, with one of our partners um, in Ontario and we started treating the first responders. Uh, and since then, what has happened is the chief medical officer has said they, all these um, firefighters need an optima um, and the union got together with the insurers and they're covering that now for all these patients. And so we're treating a lot of the firefighters in Ontario at the moment. We've had some very good bookings in the last couple of weeks and we're taking lots of records for those people. And that's a trend I think that will continue um, to grow. Um, <clears throat> you know, as I said, we've, um, the, the situation's evolving incredibly fast. Um, we're very well positioned. We've got telehealth, we have home care, we've got very robust um, pipeline of contracts. Um, you know, we're very um, comfortable with move, moving forward and as we start to open up, we expect to see revenues growing through calendar 2020. This is the home care model very quickly and I'll, I'll wrap up because we need some time for questions, but basically we can send someone to the home to get the records and then ship the device to the home and the dentist can do the fitting via telehealth and the sleep physician does his consultation via telehealth as well. Additionally, home sleep testing obviously has become more prominent as well. So everything really, we're almost the Uber of sleep now, I think, in that we can manage everything remotely and it can be done online. So, um, you know, we think that's a, a good situation for us to grow uh, very quickly at low cost. Uh, Medicare reimbursement, patients most at risk now have their uh, treatment covered by the government, which is fantastic, 64 million of them, and that's the older population who are more at risk and are more likely to need actually an alternative to CPAP within the pandemic uh, uh, situation. Um, Aeroflow, great partner. Um, we've mapped out launches through the back end of this year with them and with our other partners. They're a very fast growing regional. They have phenomenal telehealth capability as well, and so we're plugging into that at the moment as we launch our sites remotely. Uh, and starting to um, engage with patients across the US. Great board, I'm sure you guys know our board members. We've introduced them before, two new US MDs who have been great um, addition to our board, and then a great US team that's helping us roll out uh, in North America, backed by an advisory board that is second to none. So very exciting times. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. 
Thanks, Chris. That was that was great. That was really comprehensive. Um, we do, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one that might be the easiest to answer to start with is if you could please just explain the device again and how it's actually installed. So if someone wants to know exactly what the device is and how it's installed. Oh, what what is the device and how it's installed? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll go back to the photo. So it's a mouth guard, basically. Um, and the, the point of difference is that within the mouth guard, we have a 3D airway and a valve. And so a, a normal mouth guard would just bring the jaw forward to stop the tongue flopping back. Having the airway in there, we're also bypassing nose and soft palate and reducing overall collapsibility of the lateral side of the throat. And then the peep valve is a little flapper valve that ramps up the pressure as the patient breathes. So the patient's at home breathing becomes a CPAP in effect by managing upper airway airflow um, and by stabilising the mandible and the tongue base. Mm -hmm. And a, a little bit of a, uh, a deeper question here. When do you expect Oventus to become cash flow positive? Well, the con sites we have contracted now at minimum quotas um, would allow us to get the end cash flow positive. Um, we're launching one a week. We'd aim to have you know, 30 or 40 up uh, within the next uh, 12 months or so. Um, we've already got 18, so you know we're well on the way to that. And then it's a question of how long it takes them to get the minimum quotas, and it looks like anywhere from three to six months. So I would say uh, at some point um, in the next 12 months or so, um, maybe a little bit longer, but not much longer, we should be trending in that direction. So as we're tracking at the moment, uh, we're on we're on we're on track for um, uh, early uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. Chris, what were the reasons behind the decrease in cash receipts in, in Q3 then? So everyone shut up their checkbooks in March. Um, I think the whole world did. Uh, we grew we grew book revenue. We increased book revenue about 55%. And remember that was only on mostly January and February, which are two short months and difficult months to trade through, to be honest. So we were aiming to double revenue in the quarter, um, being truncated by you know, COVID-19 shutdowns, obviously affected the book revenue, but we still had a very good increase in book revenue. And then the receipts lagged because people just stop cutting checks basically. We don't see a long-term problem. In fact, we've collected a lot of that money now anyway. Um, but there was certainly some um, you know, uh, variability there in receipts as we came into the back end of the quarter as COVID started to shut the country down. Mm -hmm. As you said, uh, telehealth has been running quite well for you. It's been quite successful through this COVID period. Is it, is it more of a, a structural development maybe in the business rather than a cyclical change then? Like do you envision that in the future maybe telehealth will be a bigger part of your business? Yeah, look, um, it's a cultural shift. So, uh, and this is one of the big advantages for us due to COVID is that people are now very comfortable doing telehealth consultations. The government has enacted legislation to ensure that it's reimbursed at the same rate. Um, and it's very efficient. I mean, the sleep physicians can literally schedule a telehealth consult from within their own telehealth consult for one of our clinical educators to bring the patients into care. So. It is a permanent workflow change and some of the larger groups that we're negotiating with are very excited about that possibility of being able to bring the patient in via telehealth. So I, that, that's something that's going to continue to grow and grow very quickly, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. Maybe just a bit more, Chris, about how you've reduced costs throughout this period, as you know, most corporations have. Um, you said you've reduced costs by more than a third over the COVID period. Which specific parts of the business have been impacted by COVID? There was a question on the line about that. What part of your workforce or workflow has been impacted? Sure. So, I mean, all staff have, um, you know, we've, we've reduced salary costs across the board. We have let some people go, but not a lot because we're continuing to operate. Travel costs have dropped dramatically, and that was a big cost for us. So, that's another benefit of, um, you know, the, the telehealth um, program and the remote uh, launches. Um, you know, any non-essential spending we've deferred. Uh, so we've just been very careful with where we've invested our money and we are focused very um, laser focused on launching these sites as we continue to try and trade through COVID-19. So um, salary costs, big reduction there, travel and marketing costs. We don't really need to do any marketing. Um, we have more demand than we can cope with at the moment. So really it's just focusing on the execution and the launching of these sites. Mm -hmm. North America, obviously a huge market for you and for everyone. Um, you did point out a couple of times about the total addressable market over there. Will you be pushing into other markets in the near future? And someone wants to know, is your device available in Australia yet? Yeah, so it's, it's available uh, in the rest of the world except China. Um, we do have some customers in Europe and we have quite a few in Australia. 
Um, we're doing Australia um, first, and then we went to the US. Um, US is the most important market. It's 55% of the world market. Australia is 2%, so it didn't make a lot of sense to focus too much on the Aussie market. Um, we only have one support person in Australia. In the US, uh, we'll get that right. We'll make sure we're making money there, and then we'll go to Europe after that. Can you comment on pricing and margins? Sure. So um, we sell the device to the clinic for around about 600 US dollars. Um, they get reimbursed on average $2,400. Um, at, at scale, we'd get an 80% gross profit margin on the device. We get about 60% at the moment. Uh, scaling up through the back end of this year, we'll get to 80% gross profit. We also make about a $200 a unit gross profit on the um, service and support we provide to the clinics and helping them collaborate. Mm -hmm. What does the competitive landscape for the market look like overall for your, your specific part of the market? Do you compete with Somnomed, which is obviously also listed on the ASX? That's come from Ryan. So yeah, Sonomed sell primarily to dentists. Um, we learnt um, a couple of years ago that that wasn't a good market for us, that the dentists firstly didn't really understand the physiology of our technology. I thought it was just another mouth guard. Uh, we also knew that the sleep physicians loved it and wanted to prescribe it. So we, we just had to figure out a way that the sleep physicians could deliver the treatment and the therapy within their own facility. So I guess we sit between a Sonomed and a ResMed. Um, we have CPAP-like efficacy with the convenience of a mouth guard and our delivery model, our lab in lab, um, business model actually is delivered in a very similar way to CPAP. So we're probably more CPAP-like than we are mouth guard like uh, I don't see that um, a device that has, you know, a greatly reduced efficacy uh, compared to our device um, will be able to compete in the long term. Um, I know that's a big call, but I just think that the data is out there and sleep physicians are now starting to prescribe this as a first line of therapy in many occasions. Um, and it's been delivered within their facility. So as the lab and lab program grows and uh, the technology becomes more widely known, I think we'll have, we actually have our own market segment that we're operating in. We had to create it to be successful and, and that's what we're doing. So differentiated through the lab and lab model? And the technology. So the technology itself, you know, we've, as you see on the screen there, we've got an increase in success rates from 56% to 80% compared to a Somnomed style device. And the lab in lab business model is enabling it to be delivered within those sleep facilities as opposed to in a dental clinic. We still sell to dentists, but most of our units come through the lab in lab program. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. It's great to hear from you and we'll, we'll follow along in the future. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Next up, in about five minutes time, we have Dimerick. Stay tuned. They're a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company developing innovative new therapies in areas with unmet medical needs. We'll be back in about five minutes time. See you soon.